अनुसंधान और गुजरात इंटीग्रेटेड क्लासरूम सैटेलाइट ना माध्यम थी जोड़ती कड़ी एटले संधान वेल गुड आफ्टरनून एंड वेलकम टू दिस लेक्चर ऑन द पोएट्री ऑफ डब्ल्यू बी एच ही इज अ रियली एक्साइटिंग पोएट टू think about and read and it's impossible to do a degree in literature without reading the poetry of yeats so what we are going to do today is to take you through the historical context in which he wrote his poetry and then move to the analysis of two really important poems uh, which uh, dr rajan barrett and which i Dr. Deepa Achar, both of us from MS University, uh, we will be talking to you about. So, on that note, uh, Rajan, I uh, ask you to start with something about W. B. H. Here he is. Yeah, I think it's important to look at W. B. H. as a young person. and then as he slowly moves up and develops into a poet and a dramatist who we think about what is interesting is when you talk about his own private symbology his ideas of history and also his ideas of poetry and drama all of these fuse together and become one yeah uh if you look at his life you'll find that he lived a, an extraordinarily long life and not only a long life but he lived at a time when some of the most radical historical events were taking place both in his own country that is ireland and also in the world at large uh during his lifetime ireland moved from being a colony to being a free nation and you can find that even in his poetry you find that uh, his writing reflected these changes uh if you can see the slide next you can find that he is a key modernist writer isn't it yes i think we must think of him as a modernist writer though as a critic called graham ho calls him a r- the last romantic he writes and he begins as a romantic and then he is later a modernist along with t s eliot and ezra pound he is considered to be one of the three major modernist poets of the 20th century but what really makes his modernism quite different from the writing of pound and eliot is his preoccupation with irish nationalism uh you can see his uh emphasis on nationalism in his plays as well uh where he not only wrote plays but also produced and was very involved with the irish literary theater movement one of his first plays was catherine nehul huelan right and he starts writing at a young age and right till the time he dies i think just about 2 years before he dies he keeps writing plays yes and uh, it's interesting his involvement with I- irish nationalism uh perhaps some of you will know that ireland in the 19th century and even today is divided along uh the lines of protestantism and catholicism the protestants are mostly from england and catholics mostly uh irish yeats was from an I- anglo irish family and most people didn't feel didn't feel like they belonged in ireland they felt like they were english people who were in ireland by mistake but 
Yeats was different. He looked at Ireland as his own country, his own home. And if you look at the picture below, this is the place where he lived his uh, childhood and his life, that is County Sligo in Ireland. Yeah, one of the important things about the life of um, Yeats is his love to this woman called Maud Gon, and who was also very deeply involved with the Irish nationalist movement. And uh, what is interesting is he keeps hoping that he would marry Maud Gon, but that's not possible. And then later she marries uh, Mr. McBride. And you find that this kind of hate or pain th that he uh, has because of this uh, reject rejection and love keeps coming back again and again in his poems. Now later he also proposes to Maud Gon's daughter and however he marries Georgie Hydeleys at the age of 52. And if you can take a look at this family, this is Yates with Georgie and their two children. In order to understand Yeats's poetry, it's really important to think about Ireland in the 19th century. You find in Ireland that there's a terrible time passing in the 19th century. After the Napoleon Wars, you find that Ireland, in which most people were farmers, just like in India, you find that many, many people didn't have land and didn't have work. At the same time, the population was increasing by leaps and bounds, and most of the people were landless laborers. But what happened in the middle of the 19th century is something that we Indians can easily understand, and that is agriculture failed. It failed because they grew only one crop and that is potato and that crop uh, was destroyed because of a disease called blight. That along with extremely cold weather led to starvation and death. People died by the millions and it is estimated that in three years more than two million people died or emigrated to escape from extreme poverty and starvation. This is the very time that the Irish said that we need to have our own laws. We cannot depend on England to rule us anymore. And when you hear that, I'm sure you will be able to make connections with what was happening in India at that very time, where Indians also were saying the same thing for almost the same reasons. But what happens in the 20th century is a little different. Rajan, would you like to take over? Yeah. I think what is important in the 20th century is the two world wars that we are talking about and Yeats happens to live through both the world wars and uh, here because of the world wars like in India uh, uh, the colonized nations get into, um, into the wars in many ways and that delays what is called independence. Would you like to say something? Yeah. And the desire for home rule or Swaraj was something that Irish were aspiring for even in the 19th century. It gave uh, rise to what is called the Celtic revival. And you find that at last when England was ready to give them home rule, World War I happens and home rule is no longer possible. However, the Irish have lost their patience and in 1916, 
right in the middle of World War I, there is what is called the Easter Rising, where nationalists declare that Irish is independent. The English very cruelly crush the Rising and the leaders are executed. This is something like our first war of independence, 1857. Could I just say uh, that when we talk about the Easter Rising of 1916, uh, Yeats also has a poem which is called Easter 1916. And what is interesting about this is he talks about all the people who are part of that elite group, which uh, later he would call use in another poem of his which is called wild swans at cool now wild swans for him means these elite people who are part of the movement uh easter 1960s is a really important poem it's important because it represents it tells us about yeats's mixed feelings on one hand, he really admires the nationalists who are fighting, but he feels that the fighting has made them hard and like stone. So he talks about a beauty, but a beauty which is terrible. Um, shortly after that, another movement takes place in uh, Ireland, and this is called Sinn Féin which means we ourselves and it's it's very close to Swaraj where we ourselves rule ourselves uh, England of course did not recognize Sinn Féin and this resulted in the birth of the Irish Republican Army which fought against British forces this was successful the British Parliament decides to give home rule to uh, Ireland and in 1921 Ireland is divided into two. Irish Free State is given independence. Northern Ireland, which is mostly Protestant, remains with England. And by 1923 Irish free state becomes an independent country, Yates becomes a senator or an MP in the first parliament of Ireland. So he is an MP or a senator for almost five or six years till he becomes too ill to continue. And this is one of the stamps issued by the Irish Republic to celebrate the freedom of Ireland from England. At the same time, when Ireland was fighting for in, uh, independence politically, there was also a cultural movement which went hand in hand and that is called the Celtic Revival. Uh, would you like to say something about that, Rajan? Yeah, I think we have to think of this figure who appears again and again in the poems and plays of Yeats. And this is Kuhalan. Another one is the Lady of the Sheath. And that is the wind. So uh, in one of his poems and even in his writing, he talks about how when the wind comes, the, 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 the peasants are taken up by the idea that the woman of the sheath is coming and is a kind of a liberating force. When we talk about Kuhlin, that is again related a lot to Yeats's own personal life because he looks at this myth of regeneration and regeneration again and again and uh, that comes again sometimes with his poem like Sailing to Byzantium. And if you see um if you look at the uh, Celtic revival, you find that works which focused on Irish culture and identity, works which were based on myths and legend, their own language, that is Gaelic, become primary. And Yeats was a really important figure because not only he started using myths and legends, 
Irish myths and legends like uh, what Rajan told you about, he also started writing nationalist plays along with Lady Gregory, Edward Martin and others. Uh, these were some of the symbols that were used by the Celtic nationalists, the shamrock, the Celtic cross and so on. And you find that Yeats decides that from now on he is not going to write some kind of random poetry as he did when he was a young man but he is going to write a new kind of poetry which is focused on Ireland and Irish scenes, Irish life. He drew on legends and folklore and he writes, look at what he says. When I first wrote, he says, I went from here, I went here and there for my subjects as my reading led me and preferred to all other countries, Arcadia and India of romance. But presently I convinced myself that I should never go for the scenery of a poem to any country but my own and think that I shall hold to that conviction to the end. So he decided he is never going to use images and symbols from any other country except Ireland alone. Uh, Rajan will discuss a poem that he writes in this period, not the whole poem, but a few verses from that poem and the poem is called The Lake Isle of Innisfree. First, I think we just read through uh, the little portion that you can see and then we'll discuss it. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there and a hive for the honey bee and live alone in the bee lounge glade. Can we change the slide? Yeah. And I shall have some peace there for peace comes dropping slow dropping from the wails of the morning to where the cricket sings. Their midnight's all a glimmer and the noon a purple glow and the evening full of linnet's wings. Right? Yeah, that's the Lake Isle of Innisfree. And what is interesting about this poem is that there is this question of col colonialism which is being talked about. Remember that when we talk about the viceroys and the governor generals, we had a lot of them in India. And what is interesting is this post of the Viceroy was actually created for Ireland so that Ireland could be kept in control of the English. Now, Yeats's longing for this Lake Isle is a longing to get away and to be free. And this is in many ways considered as this kind of going back to one's own native land. Yeah. Okay. We might notice that he talks about India. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is that India is a colony but Ireland is a colony that's there much longer. And also, I think you should uh, look at the fact that he's writing, even if he's talking about a longing for freedom or a longing for a country of his own, he is still talking in very romantic terms. He's not talking in the powerful bare language that he uses later on in life. If you look at his poetic development, if you, uh, the example that we have given you is Lake Isle of Innisfree, he starts with a romantic, idealized poetic style of Shelley. And, but what marks him specially is his focus on language, skill, rhyme, rhythm and intonation. Later, he adopts a very simple and bare style and goes back with this simplicity to nationalist te themes after the Easter 1916 rising. At the same time, he develops a private mythology with gyres and uh, so on, which become, and this too becomes the subject of his poetry. Yeah, um, could, I, could I just say something before yes. we go on? Would you like me to go to the previous slide? Yeah, maybe uh, you could do that. Uh, what is interesting about Yeats as a romantic, and especially when we talk about Lake Isle of Innisfree, is this kind of a desire to escape, 
a, a desire to go back to a kind of free world and a free land. Okay, the Yates that we also know later is a Yates who's influenced by Irish, uh, by sorry, by Japanese theatre and what is called the symbolist movement. As we'll find, and as I mentioned some time ago, when he talks about the wild swans at Cool, or he's talking about the women of the Sheed. Now these are largely something that's far more than what the poem is giving you, and this is what uh, we normally associate poems with, as we'll see when we come to the second coming. Yeah. In this poem, such a short poem, but it is, it tells us about Yeats's poetic practice. If you look at the poem, it says, I made my song a coat covered with embroideries out of old mythologies from heel to throat. So he talks about a coat, but the coat is a symbol for the poetry that he wrote. A poetry which draws on old myths and legend and full of complicated images and very romantic style of writing. But the fools caught it, wore it in the world's eyes as though they'd wrought it. But, and this was immediately accepted by the world. It became very popular and people started imitating it almost. Song, let them take it, he says. It, there is more enterprise in walking naked and what he means by that is not going back maybe it's okay yeah what he means by that is that now on he is no longer going to write poetry full of embroidery but he is going to be bare and simple and he is going to write in an entirely new way if you look at this, here are some of his important poems. Uh, Lake Isle of Innisfree, would you like to talk about, uh, quickly go through these? Yeah, uh, we did talk about Lake Isle of Innisfree and this kind of romanticism that's associated with it. We also have the Easter, uh, Easter 1916, which is both romantic and a very nationalist poem. And at the same time, it's interwoven with Irish um, um, uh, metaphors and Irish history, right? Now, Among School Children is another poem that I think we all know about. And over there, one of the last lines is something that we all remember. Can you separate the dancer from the dance? Then we have another poem called Prayer for My Daughter. And of course, the Byzantium poems, Sailing to Byzantium is one of them which is talking again about a salmon swimming backstream up the river and at the same time there is this myth of Kualan in the background talking about self-regeneration and vitality and youth which is something that uh, Yeats tried in his personal life again and again and uh, uh, we, we could probably talk a lot about how he even gets married to a girl who is so much younger than him or a woman who's only 26 when he's 52. Then of course there is the ta which is something that recurs again and again in his poetry and that becomes an important symbol. In fact he buys a ta in which he and Georgie Hailey's uh, live in and I think that's in 1917 that he buys this kind of ta. Uh, then we have uh, le let's quickly go through the rest of the poems that is the circle and the circus animals desertion, the Kuhulain poems, the Crazy Jane poems. Uh, some interesting poems are Why Should Not Old Men Be Mad? Take Off That Burning Mask of Gold. And the last two poems, Leda and the Swan and The Second Coming, these are poems that we will be discussing in detail and these are often poems that are discussed in class as well. Yeah, I would like to just say that for Yeats, the mask is something that one should put on. Though he says, take off that burning mask of gold in this poem, one should become familiar with one's mask. And he's got a long theory about how masks are used, which comes back into his symbology again and again. Yeah. 
uh, we'll start now with Lida and the Swan and uh, Rajan will discuss this poem for you, open out its symbolism and tell you why this poem is really important. Take a look at the first section of the poem. A sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in her, his bill. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from a loosening thighs? And how can body laid in that white rush but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? Let us think about what uh, Yeats is trying to do here. Uh, you can see at the side that there is a picture from a Greek vase, which is extremely important for the mythology behind the story. Leda is this ravishing beauty, which uh, who is fall, who is actually somebody who attracts the eye of Zeus, who is the father of the gods. And here you have him falling in love with Leda but he ravishes her and out of that ravishment you have a huge or a new moment coming up which is the moment of Greek history. At one level Yeats wants to go back to that kind of moment because he believes in a, a tremendous as we have at Easter 1916 a tremendous beauty is born and yes that's a beautiful moment but it's also a moment as we see yeah. in the next few lines where yeah. it is, it's sad, it's terrible, and it also talks about the present, which is so frightening. Yeah, when Zeus ravishes Leda, what happens is she gets pregnant and gives birth to Helen. Helen, as you will know, is the beauty who causes, who is the cause of the Trojan War. The Trojan War results in the destruction of Troy, but side by side, even though Greek has won the war, Greece slowly falls into a decline and it gradually, Greek culture, Greek civilization disintegrates. So the first section of the uh, poem focuses on the power and violence with which Zeus takes hold of Leda and overpowers her. I also think that it's important at this point of time that here you have the First World War and the Second World War and all these tremendous catastrophes taking place which are human made in the 20th century and there is an anxiety that again Europe and European culture will be totally destroyed. So it's important to preserve it in poetry. Yeah. Now take a look at the next section of the poem. A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tar, and Agamemnon dead. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop. What she says in this, what is said in this section is a really interesting thing. She says, uh, Yeats says that if in that moment when Zeus takes Leda, he asks the question, was it possible that Leda knew what this moment was going to bring? Was it going to bring the broken wall of Troy? How Troy was looted, burnt and destroyed? Did she foresee that Agamemnon would be murdered and killed? And at that moment where Zeus as the swan is ravishing her, did she come to know that the death of civilization is going is taking place at the very moment that a new life is being created. I think we also have to think that though this seems a very modern kind of poem, 
what is important is there is Helen at the background okay and for uh, Yeats as a romantic somewhere in his past the personal has to become very important and when one reads it carefully behind the poem is the idea of Maud Gon, right and at, on the other side is the birth of the Irish nation as you have the birth of a new civilization which is taking place with Zeus and uh, Leda. Yeah. Uh, the poem is also a poem which talks about the relationship between power and knowledge. What is this relationship between knowing what is going to happen and the power that such knowledge brings? Uh, it's a poem which also talks about the violence between which can take place between men and women. It's a poem which also tells us about uh, sensuality and the impact that such sensuality may have long after that moment has passed. It offers us a view of history, a view of history which suggests to us that events which take place in the present have perhaps got their seed long, long time in the past. But at the same time, what is important is that Helen was the one who is supposed to have launched a thousand ships or been the, f the reason for the war between Greece and Troy. But in the 20th century, that is not possible. Yeats always wants to go back to this kind of royalist position, okay, a classist kind of position, which he practices in his own life because Lady Gregory is a person who funds his poetry and funds his writing. And uh, that is a problem that we perhaps would have with Yeats's uh, political position. Uh We'll now go to the next poem. And the next poem is called The Second Coming. It's a poem that was written at the time of great wars. Not only World War I, but also the terrible violence that Ireland was seeing as a result of a civil war, its guerrilla war against the British and the war generally that you, fi you found all across the world. The scene that Yeats paints in this poem is a world of chaos and disintegration. This is a poem where he draws upon the symbols that he has put together in his private mythology. He says, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. The first image is an image where the relationship between the falcon and the falconer is breaking apart. The falcon goes higher wider and wider, in wider and wider circles away from the falconer so far that the relation between the falcon and the falconer breaks down completely. When it breaks down, all that is left is anarchy. Anarchy and everywhere one can see only blood. I think uh, we can perhaps look at the actual meaning in Christian terminology of what you call the second coming. 
and we talk about something called the apocalypse and the book of revelations in the bible where you have the idea that there will be tremendous catastrophes when the second coming is going to take place that is the second coming of christ uh when we're talking about the apocalypse we're talking about how the good and the bad will be separated that's the christian understanding of what is called the second coming now when yates is talking about the second coming and as deepa mentioned to you in uh, the little bit that she said just now we're talking about a time of tremendous catastrophes we're talking about super leaders that have suddenly sprung up people like hitler people like stalin people like all these totalitarians that exist everywhere and a question is who is this new terrible beast who is going to come and be born and rule the whole world yeah. that is a fear that everybody had and that is one of the important things that is being said in the next few lines of the poem yeah if you look at the poem closely you'll find that it was as if he knew that the world as he knew it was coming to an end and he takes up the christian prophecy that jesus christ is going to come back to rule the world till the end of time but this second coming which yates talks about is quite different from the second coming imagined by christians instead of being a wondrous time with god ruling the earth you find a monstrous time with instead of christ you have a beast coming to rule the earth it, it is something also to think about that he uses the word dryers now the dryer in yates's private sim symbology his private mythology is a very very important kind of figure later on we'll show you his own drawing of what a dryer is but it you can imagine it as a kind of a cone yates believed that a dryer history is like a dryer and that every 2000 years constitutes a jaya the jaya is also like the phase of the moon that it starts from nothing then we get a full moon and then again the moon reduces till we get a no moon or amavas so what happens in human history in periods of the 2000 year period that uh, yates thinks about in his private mythology you find that he is actually uh thinking about one phase where the most important most powerful civilizational events take place the other periods are periods where civilization can decline or where civilization is not so powerful as it could be so here he is thinking about a moment where civilization is moving from one jaya to the next but these jayas are not similar they are opposite and therefore his second coming is not like the second coming of christ which is beautiful moral and welcoming in fact it is horrible and difficult and when we see the next section we will see why he says in the second section surely some revelation is at hand surely the second coming is at hand the second coming hardly are those words out when a vast image out of the spiritus mundi troubles my sight somewhere in the sands of the desert a shape with lion body and head of a man a great gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it 
real shadows of the indignant desert birds. Over here, you'll find that specifically you have the image of the gyre. You find that there is a movement from one historical period to another. The second coming is at hand, he says. But this is a second coming which is in a desert. A spiritus mandi refers to the spirit of the world. An image from the spirit of the world comes up in front of him and it is the image of the sphinx. The sphinx in Europe with head of a lion and body of a man. He sees the sphinx moving face hard as a stone and the birds, the indignant desert birds symbolizing the old period of time have to get up and fly away with the coming of this new beast. In the next section you find he says the darkness drops again. Instead of light you get darkness. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So he says, what kind of beast is going to bring to us this second coming? What kind of terrible monster, what monstrous historical age is being birthed at this moment. Just as he says in Leda and the Swan, the moment of birth actually carries with it monstrosity, the monstrous destruction, disintegration. Here too, he says, a rocking cradle is going to bring about the birth of a monster. And the Sphinx, a monster which has been sleeping for 2000 years, is going to waken and be born again. And what is this monster going to do in the coming 2000 years? This is a question that he leaves us with. Uh, in the Bi biblical reference, you have 666 as the number of the beast in the book of Revelations. And that is supposed to be Nero, the emperor of Rome, which is uh, misunderstood and people think that is a bad number. But when you translate it or these uh, Hebrew is and uh, Greek add up to numbers. So what happens over there is they're adding numbers together and you're giving numbers which become 666. Now, they're looking for a new beast. 2000 years have passed and there is which of these beasts will become the monster or the terrible beast that is going to come up. Now, another important element of this poem, we had referred to Yeats as starting as a romantic and moving on to a modernist. We can see in this poem that in the first section, we talk about the innocence is lost. Okay, When we talk about Lake Isle of Innisfree, he's looking back to that innocent past where everything is peaceful and calm, where you can go back to childhood. But over here in the second coming, that going back is not possible. This is a time when you have to face the fact that all innocence is lost and people know what they're doing. They know how terrible they are and what terrible beast they've created for themselves and here the image or the symbol of the beast is much more than what it actually is and that's why the poem becomes so fascinating. This is what Yeats does with his uh, symbolism where the beast is supposed to be more, the image is supposed to be outlast the poem or grow much more than the poem and that's why we find that the beast is always so fascinating and people try to go back to the poem and try to find out what does the poem mean. Like in the Bible, they go back to the book of Revelations and they try to find out what does this book actually say? Is it talking about today or is it talking about 
uh, an earlier period or a future period the idea of the apocalypse yeah uh one thing one other thing that you should pay attention to when you are studying this poem and that is its rhyme scheme the rhyme scheme of the poem the poem is written in iambic pentameter that is it has five stressed five unstressed uh it's it has a beat like this da dum da dum da dum da dum that's the way the poem goes and you find that this iambic pentameter which shakespeare also used is used in a very different kind of way you have no rhymes in this poem you own but you have a lot of repetition you for example you have turning and turning falcon and falconer so you have this kind of repetition this sense of echoing which you find in this poem but no rhyme schemes this irregular rhythm that you find in this poem contributes to the sense of chaos and disintegration that you find in a poem in the second coming the second coming leaves us feeling that there is no escape from the terrible human history that faces us that confronts us we do not have a byzantium where creative things are being fashioned instead we have a time of destruction not just for one year or a few years but a but whole centuries of destruction that lie ahead of us the family yeah yeah we've given you an image a cross section of a gyre so that you understand yeah. where would the falconer be and where would the falcon be and yeah. how they're moving away from each other so and the they're losing control so the center is the uh, falconer yes. and the circle the spiral is the way that the falcon goes yeah now these are gyres that ye taken from yeats's book a vision where he develops his private uh, his private symbology and he goes to the extent of showing how the jays are associated with handshakes how different people have come up and died out in uh, a certain age and he's tried to find out historically uh, how his theory of jays actually work yeah if you look at the image you'll see that the jays fit into one another the primary and the anti antithetical they fit into one another and they are opposite in nature so after 2000 years of creativity and a rising shining culture you will have the next 2000 years collapsing being a time of destruction and it is this that he describes in the second coming this is an image from the sistine chapel painted by michelangelo which represents the second coming of christ here you'll find that it's all golden bathed in light things are happening things are beautiful orderly and uh holy but the image of the beast that we showed you a little while back of a lion headed beast slouching waiting to be born is absolutely antithetical the very opposite of this image painted by michelangelo and finally we end with this uh epitaph taken from a poem that yeats wrote he says cast a cold eye on life on death horsemen pass by this is what is written on his grave in the county sligo the place where he was buried finally at the very end of this lecture we would like you to take out your pens and pencils and write down from this slide possible books that you could refer to uh perhaps you can look them up in the library or you can 
ask your library to order at least one or two of these books. Please can we have the slide on for a minute so that students can take down the... Uh, Yeah. Um, if you have recorded this uh, show, I'm sure you will be able to at least pick up one or two of these titles. And finally, I hope you have understood and enjoyed these two poems that we have discussed, got a sense of Ireland and Yeats's place in Ireland and the importance of his poetry both to modernism to an understanding of modernism as well as to the history of Ireland itself. I hope also that you've been able to make connections between Ireland and India and in fact you all should know that Yeats and Rabindranath Tagore were good friends and Yeats wrote the introduction to Gitanjali. Finally, uh, I'll give Rajan the last few words. No, I think there are also the famous Purohit Swami uh, papers where uh, Yates has this kind of collaboration with Purohit Swami and there's a lot of work being done on that. And uh, by and large, I think what is important is that we must think about how Yates, uh, you have what you call an organicist poet who Yates is. He begins as a romantic and keeps growing and developing. And as in the morning, Deepta was telling me that he writes his best poetry after he gets the Nobel Prize. So does a poet say that I'm a poet and stop writing? Or does a poet keep writing, changing and growing? We must remember that it was T.S. Eliot who saw his symbolist drama at the Hawk's Well, where you have a Japanese artist dancing over there. And that's when you have him being called a modern dramatist also. Thank you. Thank all of you. And please do get back to us with any questions. Even if you write to us or email us at our department, we will be very happy to respond to you. Thank you very much. Questions? Sandham, all Gujarat integrated classroom. Satellite na madhyam thi jodti kadi, itle Sandham.